cool. <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> Professional start to uh, our first live stream. Um, hello, uh, internet that is uh, very uh, close to me and very far away at the same time. Uh, we have 67 people, uh, a nearly nice number, uh, uh, listening and uh, watching this stream right now. And uh, my name is Martin Pichlima, and uh, I'm here to say welcome because we have so many great guests that will uh, and uh, great students that will present that I will take as little time as possible for this. I have a cheat sheet here that I don't forget uh, to thank people because that's always uh, like a lot of people have been helping with this endeavor of Summer Games uh, 2020 at you online. Um, and I should mention some of them. So first of all, uh, we have 20 games from our students that will uh, be presented over the next four hours in four one-hour blocks with different guests. Um, we have four external guests that we uh, that I am very grateful that they are joining us. Uh, the first one is Marina from IO. Uh, later we will have Shark, Christus, and Thomas. They will all introduce themselves a little bit later. So um, all great people that uh, uh, I want to thank that they are joining us here. Uh, we have four of our teachers that will uh, lead through an hour each. The first one is Miguel, and then Yoruna, uh, um, Hayo, and Mess will also host their sessions. And uh, I also want to especially thank, I want to thank all students that are that take the time during exam time, um, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, in a complete crazy situation on this planet to actually just come here, join us, uh, show their games uh, uh, live and uh, speak into the void, just like I do uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, I especially want to point out Alberto Rego and Alex, who have been helping us a lot with uh, setting up uh, the Twitch stream with, uh, uh, I don't know, installing bots that uh, and overlays and um, fancy stuff that will make this an awesome session, I hope. Um, and with this, uh, I say welcome to Summer Games 2020 and hand over to Miguel, who can unmute himself now. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you um, for joining us on this uh, celebration of student games. My name is Miguel Sicat. I'm a professor here at the ITU, where I teach uh, things about games. And I will be your host for the next uh, give or take hour. I'm lucky enough to have another host with me. Uh, Marina from IO Interactive. Uh, hi, Marina. Hello. <laughs> um, but uh, this is not about us. This is going to be about the student games. So let's just start uh, showing the games. And the first one in our list uh, this afternoon is um, Ladder of the Aesir. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Uh, Nikolai Jensen will be uh, introducing his game, uh, made with other people, and uh, it's an exploration game that draws inspiration from Nordic mythology. So without further ado, uh, Nikolai, it's yours. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. So like that. Just bear with me for a second. All right, so um, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So um, uh, our game is called, uh, my name is Nikolai and our game is called Ladder of the Aesir. As Miguel said, it's an exploration game. It's inspired by Nordic or Norse mythology. And uh, we'll just see how this goes. I'm gonna play the intro for you, for the game, which we made. And if everything goes fine, you will get a decent frame rate, I hope.
All right, so um, this game takes place in a world where people try to survive after the last battle of the gods. Um, it's a narrative-driven single-player experience. And uh, we based our story on uh, the Nordic version of the apocalypse called Ragnarok, uh, which ended the world um, according to the Nordic, Nordic, Nordic mythology. And uh, so you live in this barren, uh, rocky world where uh, all the gods have died and the world has fallen apart and humanity is struggling to survive. So uh, in the game, you take the role as the protagonist Urn, uh, on, sorry, as he sets out in search for his mentor, Ottar, who has vanished. Uh, Ottar went looking for a relic, which was supposed to be able to awaken the gods and give the world a fresh start. Uh, and you are going out into the world to try to find him to find out uh, what has happened to him. So as you venture forward, you will uncover uh, some clues to what happened and you will learn about the origin of the world. Uh, it's intended to be a moderately paced uh, game rather than a fast paced game. And it's based more around the notion of exploring and visiting locations than you know, doing battle and, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, we use a lot of energy building a background story and lore uh, that would be interesting and engaging. And we wanted to create a, a world that felt uh, vertical and imposing. And we wanted to, to, be, as, oh, to be as good looking as, uh, as possible and to accurately reflect the sort of the lore and the backstory we imagined for the world. And um, we wanted to tell more than anything the story of the world and the people who are living there. And uh, that is, in short, our presentation. Um, uh, you can uh, download a demo of it if you're interested. It's out in, uh, it's on itch, and you can see the address here. And uh, if you have any questions, um, shoot away. Thanks, Nikolai. Uh, Marina, uh, now it's uh, your turn for some yes. thoughts. Uh, thank you, Nikolai. I think, uh, so I actually, took a look at all the summaries for all the, at least the first six uh, projects. And uh, I downloaded this one, played around a bit. Um, I think the fact that you went for the Nordic folklore and mythology, that's a, that's a topic that is starting to pick up uh, lately from TV series to, as we all know, Ubisoft's uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, I think it's a very appealing topic that people are starting to pick up a lot more. So uh, I don't know if that was uh, your point with this or your goal uh, with it, but I think it, uh, it can have its own audience. I like the fact that when game developers bring something from their background, uh, cultural background into the games, I think it makes for a more original experience. Um, and while I was playing around, I can definitely tell that you went for a compelling setting because it is beautiful to look at. And I'm actually, uh, wondering what is your inspiration for it, but I'm not asking the questions now. Uh, maybe we can talk after. Uh, it takes me, it takes me to that uh, black beach in uh, in Iceland, maybe with the with the cliffs and the volcanic rocks and so on. That it looks kind of like that. Um, I was expecting to to run into dead ends inside the game, but I didn't, which is great. Um, and yeah, uh, what I can tell you is that. Um, I think it looks a bit, if I am to, to compare it, uh, it brings me back to a game that I played before. It's also just, a, just as beautiful and it's about the compelling setting, not about the, the gameplay that much. And that one is called uh, The Old City. That's a game, uh, I'm not sure if I recommend it, but it's uh, very similar to this. So if you want to look into it, uh, go for it. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it looks uh, beautiful. It's beautiful to, to look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's a it's a very impressive game. Uh, if I can ask a question, um, so what's the you you talked about sort of the importance of creating the lore and and the narrative. What 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 drove you to that to that uh, sort of design decision? Well, I mean, like our course was basically called Game World. So I mean, it wasn't so much about doing a game. We basically just wanted to do a game simulator, well, a walking simulator, sorry, and we wanted to sort of experiment with or. or to go into the depth with it, developing the story and the corresponding world, right? So that was basically what drove us. I mean, it wasn't really about gameplay or or anything else. It was about creating like a, a beautiful, beautiful world which, which you can sort of relate to in, in, in some some senses. So we basically had all our emphasis on that. 
um, uh, so yeah excellent great uh, thanks i i have i have uh, i have just seen the game and it's uh, it's fantastic you and your team you have to play it you have to play proud it proud of it i'll i will play it i will play you must it. you must you must can i yes. can i just start so who who did the voice at the beginning of the game uh that was a guy we found on fiverr okay. basically yeah because so. i mean it was uh, both uh, a bit uh, funny but also thrilling at the same time it sounded like uh, uh, the guy went to Ragnarok and back. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very yeah. compelling. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like a, it's got this German accent, which kind of like ah, it, it okay. works and works <laughs> not. You know, it, it works and it doesn't work. I don't know. Like it's kind of yeah, it's difficult. He, he does a better job than me though. So uh, okay. yeah, interesting. Mm. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a very packed schedule, so I have to thank Nikolai and his team uh, for presenting, and I, we need to move on to. Uh, the next project, which is, um, and now we are going for something completely different. Uh, if you are watching this stream, you're probably interested in the games industry, and you may have heard that there's uh, issues with regard to uh, work-life quality. Um, the next project has to do with uh, how to make uh, great games with great teams of happy people and using sustainable processes. So uh, I'm very happy to present uh, Rego who will talk about his project Sustainable Game Development Framework. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Miguel. And I'll just uh, share my screen here. OK. All right. Well, uh, let's put it on full screen. It should be fine. So um, yeah, so um, I will. Uh, talk about why is there a need for a sustainable game development framework. Well, making video games is hard work. Um, it takes a combination of many different uh, uh, individuals, uh, very talented individuals with different worldviews, skills, opinions, uh, and they need to learn how to work together. Artists working with designers, engineers, writers creates a challenging environment that you know constantly changes and and the iterative uh, design process is also very hard to hard to work with and and on on you know on top of all these things um the passion that drives people uh in the games industry can sometimes you know lead to extremes uh which manifests in uh working long hours or just the general you know fighting fires uh trying to trying to fix bugs um and it also uh, because you know a lot of the, uh, all these people are really um, uh, engaged and involved, the the conflict can arise in terms of uh, you know design decisions and and all these kind of things. And so what I found is is that we all associate these uh, these things with you know what we believe makes great games. As many great games have been made through this, and 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 this is a definitely a big challenge. So it, it's quite easy to you know believe uh, and take that this is a natural part of making games, all these issues, and that great products uh, actually require these great sacrifices. Um, so in my thesis, I wanted to challenge this idea uh, and figure out if a way, what if we could make great games through great teams, happy people, and sustainable processes. And you know, how can we actually achieve this without sort of feeling like this? Um, um, so, this is what the uh, Sustainable Game Development Framework was created for. Um, it's a practical tool uh, for producers and leaders in the games industry to achieve that, that goal that I just described to you. Uh, great teams, happy people, sustainable processes, and at the end, uh, great games. Um, so in the, in the model, uh, as you can see, four large circles, the four colorful ones, illustrate four internal dimensions to the game development process, which deals with individuals, teams, processes, and games. Uh, and these are all from a producer's perspective or a leader's perspective. Um, all these uh, dimensions are interrelated. They affect one another. Uh, and these interrelationships actually make up the six guiding principles of the framework. Uh, the responsibility of a producer or, or leader is to make sure that these different principles are balanced uh, and uh, attention uh, are, are spread out to all of these because no, not one of the dimensions can exist without the other. So I will briefly go through the six guiding principles. 
The first one is about um, supporting directors and leads with setting and maintaining vision for the games, clear direction and vision, uh, along with aligned expectations and roles within the, within the teams is extremely important to be able to uh, work together for that shared goal. Over communicating, deciding what is important and then over communicating that, making sure that everyone is aligned is the critical part in making sure that we can achieve great things. The second principle deals with motivation, um, the motivation of individuals uh, towards the games they're making. Uh, it's about uh, making sure that there's awareness that you know, teams are made up of individuals. It's about being mindful of you know, physical, mental, emotional health of, of all these different people and, and, and what are the different things uh, uh, that motivate them to, 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 to be their best version of themselves. And it's also about being supportive of personal and professional growth, which are extremely important in order to keep talent in the industry and, 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 and grow together and, and keep their needs. The third principle deals with uh, structure and providing structure through processes. Uh, and the important uh, parts of this uh, framework or this uh, principle is adopting an agile mindset and, and making sure that uh, the tools that are built uh, are simple, they are easy to use, and they support uh, wherever needed and automation is used uh, wherever possible. A critical part of structure is that there's continuous improvement and feedback loops built into the processes. So there's always a continuous um, you know, reflection on what is working, what is not working, and how can uh, these, uh, these be improved. Um, last but not least, estimation and planning for contingency is a really, really, uh, really good idea because uh, as we know, and I've just shown in the beginning, a lot of things that can go wrong uh, when making games. The fourth principle is about coordination and alignment uh, with processes within the teams. It's a uh, relation to you know, vision and direction and how communication, frequent communication uh, should happen is, is extremely important. And this can be done through uh, design and effective meetings, uh, for instance, and, and making sure um, that alignment happens uh, through back briefing or any other tools is a critical part in making sure that alignment uh, and coordination happens. The fifth principle deals with uh, trust and cooperation. Uh, these are integral parts of, of, of successful teams, of high-performing teams, uh, and it's about acknowledging different personalities that exist. Uh, all uh, different people have different uh, work ethics and, and, and approach to, to, to solutions, and therefore it's really important to understand these, uh, these differences to be able to uh, you know, get people to, to work together. Uh, a critical part in building trust and, and, and uh, a beneficial cooperation is, is about conflict and resolution and how a critique and feedback is organized because game development is such an iterative process uh, there tend to be disagreements but how these are uh, dealt with especially when people are passionate are extremely important to be mindful of um, and last but not least the physical office layout might also have an effect although in this work from home environment this might have a, a slight uh, less relevancy uh, and last but not least, the sixth dimension is about onboarding people to processes. Uh, and it's about uh, adopting a growth and learning mindset. Uh, the, uh, having an approach that change is inevitable and your, your, your um, ability to adapt uh, to constantly changing uh, um, circumstances is, is critical in being able to, uh, to succeed uh, in such a competitive industry. And, and last but not least, uh, legacy is also an important part uh, uh, when dealing with, with, with change and growth because you can't just uh, go in you know, and, 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 uh, and implement the process if, if people are not okay with that and they, they, you don't know how it used to be done. So there, these are very extremely delicate matters that, that has to be dealt with. Um, so, I wanted to finish this presentation with sort of a challenge or a question that what can you do if you are a producer or a leader in the industry, but also in, in, in your, uh, if, if you're not uh, one of those people and you want to see, want to see change. Uh, and the three-step process I suggest is that consider one of these principles that you want to start looking into, uh, decide on the next action and just do it. Um, 
And remember that making games is a marathon and not a sprint. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gregor. And now it's uh, Marina. What are your thoughts about the framework? Yeah, uh, very interesting, uh, different. Um, I think it bears a lot of uh, relevance when it comes to production. I think uh, not only, I mean, we, everyone, I think in the games industry is relying on uh, agile processes, on a sprint methodology, but it's always good to take a look at all the other um, areas that can impact this because it's not only production, it's operations, it's support and, uh, and so on. So I think it's very relevant. I like the idea that uh, um, it's uh, sustainable. Uh, I'm a fan of that myself. <laughs> Um, I think you said a couple of things there, like, uh, such as uh, communicating frequently, over communicate what is important. Now, there could be a question of whether this falls in line with the paradigm of uh, sustainability. Um, but um, I think uh, I think it's a uh, very relevant. And for example, the, the having a feedback culture, this is something that uh, we have started doing as well because we realize how important it is especially in studios that keep growing um office layout you have no idea i mean um, i talked to hundreds of candidates right you have no idea how many people have asked me do you have separate offices or is it open office uh from all levels of seniority um and that's uh, that's an interesting uh, point that you added there i uh, i appreciate that you have that insight uh, necessary to to put that there um, yeah, and adaptability to constant change. That's a thing that I think that's, uh, that's the main, I think that's the most important aspect of this. Uh, I don't know if you have experience in the games industry, but if, if, uh, if you talk with uh, anyone, I think in the industry, they will tell you that this is one quality that they require in their people, adaptability to change. Things change from one day to the other. So you gotta fall on your, uh, uh, on your, uh, on your feet at all times. So yeah, very relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Gregor. That was a extremely fascinating project. Uh, I really appreciate that you had the time to present it uh, to us today. Uh, now it's time to move on to the next project. Um, well, uh, maybe some of you have pondered uh, whether video games can tell stories or not. Uh, it's still a debate, uh, but in order to maybe perhaps finish that debate once and for all, um, Lucas is going to present a framework for the correlation of interaction and narration, which he calls symbiotic design. Lucas. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, good to see you and thanks for making the time. Um, just uh, quickly, uh, the first thing, one of the first things I heard at ITU uh, as a student was Miguel standing with a big basketball at his desk saying, uh, if you want to sell stories, go write a book. But uh, we, we beg to differ and we've uh, presented, we've made this presentation for you that I'll just quickly share. And uh, I really hope the sound works. We have made symbiotic design to give the games industry a common language, one that they can use when balancing the interaction and narration of story-oriented video games. Symbiotic design is two things. It's a tool for evaluating how in-development prototypes function, and it's a tool for developing new games from scratch. Here's a quick guide of the core terms we use. When we talk about instances, we refer to the events or moments of a particular video game. We're seeing that games are segmented in instances, like movies are in scenes. By interaction, we refer to what the designers intend for players to do in these. And by narration, we refer to what the designers intend for the story's development. In addition to these, we have three modifiers represented by a plus, minus, and zero, which will make sense when we give you a few examples in a second. To determine the correlation type of an instance, you compare the interaction and narration of the specific instance with what went before in that game. For the correlation types themselves, we borrow the symbiosis terminology from biology. 
Here are three quick examples from the beginning of a game many of you might have played. The Last of Us starts off with a parasitic cutscene. There are no interactions here, but an emotional plot and character development. Then, a mutualistic instance allows the player to get familiar with basic interactions, while objects in the environment spark the narrative conflict of this mysterious viral infection. A few instances later, a commensalistic arena functions as a gameplay tutorial. Kill or stealth around X amount of enemies in this confined space before you can continue. The interaction possibilities are varied for the player, while the arena offers nothing new to the narrative. With symbiotic design, different development disciplines can talk about the intentions and purposes of their video games. Do we want this instance to be this parasitic, designers can ask themselves about an existing prototype. Or if starting from scratch they might say, we should make this instance mutualistic because we've just had a parasitic cutscene. The framework might also alleviate some of a company's reliance on playtesters to identify the pitfalls of their games. Inkslinger is a romance punk narrative driven typing game that we have developed using the symbiotic design framework. You play as an inkslinger, a professional letter writer who tends to daydream about her tragic past. We will now show you a couple of different instances from the game and specifically highlight how we have balanced interaction and narration in them. The Inkslinger's first client is Brasny, her boss at the workshop. This instance is mutualistic. It's quickly revealed that the Inkslinger has been offensive to a previous client, and Brasny wants a letter of apology written for this person. Players are introduced to the core typing interaction of the game, while the narrative contextualizes the situation and sparks the plot. Bresni's final remarks trigger a daydream. These are the parasitic instances of our game. Much like a cutscene, there's no interaction in them, but the narrative of the Inkslinger's identity is slowly revealed. Every client encounter in our game is followed by one of these parasitic daydreams. The encounters, however, vary in their symbiotic correlations. After the first daydream, Tetherheart enters the workshop. This is a commensalistic instance. The interaction in this instance is a plus, as players are now presented with more options to choose from. Options that both change the outcome of the encounter, as well as the ending of the game. Meanwhile, the narrative is unchanged. Tetherheart's need to have a letter written for her son does not substantially add anything to the plotline of the game, but serves as a side story in the grander scheme of the plot. We skip the next daydream to finish with another encounter. King Corner is a local mob boss on Isle Shama. His encounter is another commensalistic instance. On the interaction side, there's now a timer added to provide additional challenge for the player. Narratively, his encounter is similar to Tetherheart, as it does not directly develop the story. The full Inkslinger game will have twice the amount of encounters and daydreams as we have just showed you. These will be instances where we explore and experiment with different symbiotic correlations. Thank you very much for watching. Yes, that was it for me. Thank you very much. Marina. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I actually knew about this, uh, this project from uh, Lucas himself. Uh, we met online for an uh, online event uh, somewhere on the interwebs. Um, and he pushed this, uh, this project to me and he said, hey, we've done this. And uh, they actually 
wrote an article about it. Uh, they took a Miami uh, level in Hitman 2, and then they broke it down uh, with this method, which I thought was great. I love when that happens. Um, I think this is, this is analysis taken to the next level. Like, uh, I like that. Um, and I like the fact that it's cross-discipline. You, you, uh, you looked at biology to, to implement it into, into game design. Um, I also like the idea that it can be used not only as an overview or as a communication tool, easier communication tool between designers, but also it can be used as a, as a way to identify a pattern. So not to oversaturate, for example, with only parasitic instances, but you can also have narrative and like alternate a bit. I think uh, it can raise some red flags uh, for, for people if they really look at it from, from this point of view. One thing I would like to, maybe you can put this in practice somehow. I mean, you have, and you've applied it here. You've showed us a couple of examples and you put it for, uh, for, for Hitman 2 as well. Uh, but maybe, you know, when uh, some of your colleagues or if you're in part of a project, a group project that are making a game, some students making a game, maybe try to apply it there and, and see if, uh, if they can get themselves to communicate in those terms. That would be very interesting to, to see. I would like to, to take a look at that, to see the results of that. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Lucas, it's a, it's a very impressive project um I, I, yes. we need to, we, we need to talk I, we, i'm not i'm not going to admit in front of an audience that i may be convinced uh, sure <laughs> but it's a, a it's an ambitious project and i think uh, you've hit a, a a lot of nails on their heads um, and i'm if not convinced closer to being convinced than i was before it's an impressive project and i think uh, you've really understood how, how narratives can be seen in the, from the perspective of games. And I really appreciate that you use the word parasitic for the type of narratives that I personally dislike. Uh, yeah, I'm sure of it, yeah. Sure Sorry, is there time for a quick, uh, just a quick comment? Quick comment, yes. Yeah, just to tie some of the things together that Marina spoke about. Um, we read an article on PC Gamer a couple of months back about, uh, about the release of Half-Life Alex and that Valve realized after playtesting um, the initial part of the game that, that they were playing too much with the patience of fidgety uh, VR players. And, and as, a tool of, as a tool for analysis, symbiotic design could be used to already identify that before playtesting by saying, okay, we have two hours of parasitic content in the beginning here, maybe we'll uh, be tedious. So just to give you an example of, of industry practice. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your thank time. You. <laughs> thank you for your, for your work. It's yeah, no very, works. very impressive. And now it's time to move to the next uh, project. And as we have all uh, learned, most of us knew already, video games can help us stay together uh, during this uh, last uh, pandemic or during this pandemic, uh, video games have helped us connect to people and, and enjoy. And what better way of connecting with people than sitting together with your buddies and, and playing games? Uh, so I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce uh, Alberto, who's going to present Tankball, which is a couch party game about spiking down your friend's tanks with a giant ball inside a shrinking arena. Alberto, sorry. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Miguel. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alberto Dibice, and I'm a student at IQ Games uh, in the technology track. So as uh, Miguel said, I will today showcase to you Tankbo, uh, which is uh, a nice way, as I said, to keep, keep in touch with uh, your friends uh, and meet with them. But it's also difficult to showcase during these times. Uh, anyway, I, I will try my best. So uh, in Tankable, uh, you can uh, roll out with up to three friends in uh, a free-for-all shrinking arena uh, in uh, uh, a constant adrenaline rush with the matches that are super short, one to three minutes. And also one thing that we really want to do is to uh, allow players to keep playing even after their tank is demolished uh, so they can keep annoy others or uh, at least strategize. Um, also, the most difficult part about meeting with friends and playing together is 
that is always difficult to have a lot of controllers. So we supported the, every type of controller. You can bring whatever together and it just works. Um, so let's just jump into the game. And of course, I don't have people here with me uh, during these times that can play with me, but I will try to showcase you some features of the game. So uh, right from the start, let's go into settings and you have some uh, options to see the controls or there are two maps right now, but that can be expanded. Uh, let's go inside the game. And uh, once you launch the game, uh, it will wait for more than two players to connect. And uh, once a player connects, you can already start going around the map and uh, trying the controls so that you can familiarize and uh, get the gist of what you, you have to do. Uh, then uh, when uh, more controllers connect, and um, it, you can start playing. Technical hiccups. Uh, so when you start playing, uh, you can do a few things. Uh, you can shoot others, but that is not harmful to them. You can just uh, uh, bump them away and stand them for half a second so that you can get to the ball. Or you can use the dash to either reposition yourself uh, or uh, get to the ball. Or even um, like avoid getting it. When you touch the ball three times, you get to spike mode. So you can destroy other players. Uh, and the goal of the game is to be the last one standing. But as I said, uh, even if uh, you are the um, it, you get destroyed, you respawn as a turret that can move around the arena, and this way you can just aim for the people and uh, like bump them away super fast. Uh, let's try this out the door. Well, um, so after you you play a bit. You, you can see that the arena is uh, shrinking over time and the ball is getting bigger. And this is how we managed to make it so that the matches are not boring and not too long. Uh, you can, of course, as you can see now, it's super easy to get the ball. And when you finish, you get into a leaderboard so you can keep playing and strategize uh, to see which one of your friends you want to destroy first uh, so that they, they don't have to win the actual match. Uh, as I showed you, there are two maps. In this one, there is the patch of sand in the middle that slows you down. Uh, in the first one, it's really simple so that you don't have any inconvenience, but this can be easily expanded uh, so that you can uh, actually, we can develop new maps with new uh, peculiar features. Uh, I know this may not have been super fun, but uh, uh, let's move to a uh, trailer of the game that will showcase how the game is actually when you play it with friends. Cool, and that's about it for me. I want to thank all the guys that made this game with me. So Erlen, Jonas, Marco, and uh, Michael. And uh, if you like the game and you want to try it with your friends, you just go to tankball.fun, download the game, uh, grab some beers and some controllers, and uh, have fun with it. Thank you for the opportunity to share this game. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. What do you think, Marina? Uh, I think it's fun. I think it's fun and it's colorful, and I think it, uh, you know, caters to to a new normal that we're all in, right? Uh, so playing with each other, playing online, um, and managing to entertain ourselves and socialize while we're not necessarily physically uh, next to uh, next to each other. I think. Um, uh, also at IO, we've uh, we've had uh, we changed during this whole pandemic. Uh, so when people were all working from home, we had our Friday bars were switched with LAN parties and online bar Friday bars and so on. So 
uh, and we were looking for games to play. Um, and there is a number of them out there, and I think we tried them all. But uh, it's uh, it's good to have one more to to look at. I think it's fun, um, and it definitely, uh, as I said, it caters to to the new uh, normal that we're all getting used to. Um, I like the addition, for some reason, I know it's a detail, but I like the addition of sand in the arena, uh, slowing down uh, the players moving. I think it gives it a bit uh, more depth. Um, and I also like how it has uh, like such a full, um, like the controller is uh, made for all like Xbox 360, One, PS3 and 4 and the Nintendo Switch. I like that. Uh, that's very thoughtful. Uh, looking ahead. And also you, Alberto, uh, you, it says there that you've been producer, game designer, programmer. I mean, wow, <laughs> done it all. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, yeah, I think it's fun. I think it's fun and it's colorful and uh, yeah, well done. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Alberto, I have a quick question for you. Um, I have this pocket theory about uh, local multiplayer games. They, they all fall into one of two categories. So is this a game that helps you stay friends with your friends? Or is this a game that will break friendships? Well, I, I guess it depends on what kinds of friends you have. Uh, it can do both. And uh, it, it depends how much competitive you are. But it can definitely do both. OK, then I'll, I'll, I'll play it, but I'll play it with uh, friends I don't want to be friends with anymore. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And now we are moving on to um, the last of our uh, games in this first block. Um, games are about time, uh, the time we use in them, but also they allow us to live longer lives. Games are, uh, games are also about choices and decisions and let us evaluate what to, what to think. Uh, and uh, our last game of this first block uh, is mysteriously presented as, uh, let me read you the tagline, to avoid your death, an ancient being helps you manipulate time, but at what cost? Time and choices, what's there not to like? Uh, Tobias is going to be presenting uh, his game, uh, Temporal Fraction. Tobias, it's all yours. Thank you, Miguel. And yeah, I will present uh, in a moment. Just need to share the screen. Good one. And uh, presenting. So yeah, I'm going to present the game Simple Refraction, which I co-developed uh, with my team in the course Game World Design. And uh, I will show you a short trailer in a moment, as soon as this works. Yes. So let's go to move to it. way home from work, you're getting run down by a car. Yet, a mere moment before your incredible end, everything slows down. You are met by a mysterious creature called the Ancient, claiming to help you save yourself from death. You are taught how you can alter the state of objects when knowing the symbol of their time essence. You follow the ancient's guidance, learning the symbols spread across the city. uses them to elder the essence of obstacles in the way.
this still world, you can see humans in the environment, walking home from work, doing mischief, and more. As you journey through the city, you begin to see the creatures. What stories are the drawings trying to tell? As you learn more, they begin to follow. But what are their intentions? In the dim light of the city in the evening, who can we trust? So yeah, Temporal Fractions is set in a setting where the time has almost stopped for the for your main character, who's almost run over by a cow. And this creates a setting where a normally dynamic ab object becomes static. And this, uh, as designers, have allowed us to do obstacles that uh, normally would pass in a mere moment, like the skateboard accident shown in the trailer. In the same way, also when stopping, almost stopping time, we have created another world beside ours where these creatures that are roaming around the city have their own culture, which the human never will see as they will decay in mere moments in human time. Also, we have chosen this dark setting to allow us to use light to its fullest, showing relevant areas and objects by lighting, having light shown on them. Moment. The game is currently available at itch under the following uh, internet address. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now that's uh, quite a mystery, right? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Um, it made me so I don't know if uh, if uh, your point was to create a mystery around it and uh, make people download it just to just to see what it's about, but uh, you made me do that. So I downloaded it uh, yesterday uh, to just roam around in it a bit. Um, and uh, well, first thing, like the that ancient being that welcomed you is very creepy. So if that was the purpose, you succeeded. Um, and um, I think that no, I actually I uh, I like that you actually block some uh, some roads to allow the player to actually follow the red line and to guide them through and not just wander around randomly. Um, I like the music; it's very ominous and it helps with the with the setting. It really adds there. Um, and then, you know, if we're talking about dark alleys and wandering around looking for clues to figure out what's happening and does it ring a bell? Uh, <laughs> our agent uh, 47 is, uh, is doing that all the time. Uh, so um, I think uh, I think it's good. I like the whole concept of time standing still and you roaming around, taking your time to discover the world um, around. Yeah, well done. Yeah, I agree. It's a very very interesting game world you've you've created there. What what were the the visual references? What kind of uh, world you were thinking about when you were making this game? Uh, well, actually, we just went for a low poly uh, aesthetic in the game because it allowed us within the span of a semester to create a lot of uh, different uh, assets, uh, giving life into the city setting despite everything being static. And I can't really remember what our inspiration was for the general setting, but uh, I think uh, a lot of the game using light, I think an alien game or something, uses light to guide the player around. So that's an uh, inspiration from a lot of games. 
Are you muted? I am not muted anymore. Uh, it, it connects very well with the first game we saw in this block uh, with Ladder of the Aesir. Uh, I think that the sort of the capacity to create a, a interesting universes is, is, uh, is really showing. Um, but I have to say that, oh no, uh, we've, uh, we've reached the, the end of this first block. Uh, thank you, Nikolai, Reiber, Lucas, Alberto, Tobias, and all of your teams for uh, sharing with us your games. It's been, a, it's been quite a trip. Thank you, Marina, for uh, commenting and, and giving feedback. It's been a pleasure to have you here. I had a, I had a, a wingman for this, so someone was whispering all these points, and that's Agent 47. I have him here with me. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's been a pleasure, absolutely. Thank you very much. And we will be back at five with the second block of games. See you around. Mm -hmm.